Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session on mind-blowing neurotechnology. Um, I am Nita Farahani, and I'm a professor of uh, law and philosophy at Duke University. Delighted to be your moderator for this conversation today. Wanted to give you a little context about both what you're going to hear today and how the session is going to proceed. So what you're going to hear are the extraordinary advances that are happening right now, whether they are in clinical trials or already in therapeutic applications that, uh, are that are enabling people to regain all kinds of functions that they may have lost, to be able to treat neurological disease and disorder, and potentially to enable a future in which our brains can be decoded and used to interface with all of the rest of our technology. We're gonna hear from one of the leading implanted neurotechnology companies who has developed an incredibly innovative approach about how to intercept, how to receive, interpret, decode, and potentially stimulate neural signals from the brain, addressing one of the leading challenges of getting into the brain. We'll then hear from one of the leading companies who's recently been given FDA breakthrough designation that's a wearable brain-computer interface technology, integrating with augmented reality as an assistive technology that potentially could become something that's far more widespread than just enabling people who have lost functionality. And then we'll hear from one of the leading companies that is treating through neurostimulation, essential tremor and Parkinson's disease, and how modulating the nervous system can be extraordinarily empowering for people. We'll frame all of this around a conversation of enabling self-determination over our brains and mental experiences. First up will be Tom Oxley, founder and CEO of Synchron, to talk about the extraordinary advances. After he provides his presentation, we'll do a fireside chat between me and Tom, getting into some of the ethical issues that come from a world of greater brain transparency. Then we'll hear from Andreas Forslund. I'll come up and introduce him. And we'll hear last from Kate Rosenbluth from Kayla Health uh, and round it out with your questions. So please be preparing your questions for that final session. Let's get into it. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Tom Oxley. I'm an interventional neurologist and I'm the CEO of a company called Synchron that has an implantable brain computer interface technology that I'm excited to talk to you all about today. So I don't know if it was the allergies, there's a lot of pollen going around, there's not much oxygen in the air, but I got here a couple of days ago and I decided to completely rewrite this keynote because I didn't like where it was. So we're going into a little bit of uncharted territory, but I, I wanted to bring a question to the audience that I normally, I haven't really asked before and posed, and I don't think many people think about, and black mirrors out there and all this dystopian views on what brain computer interfaces are is beginning to pervade the way that we think about this technology. And so I wanted to pose the question to you all, what would it take for you to have a implanted brain computer interface put into your brain? And I want to take you on that journey with what it might look like and maybe share some of the experiences of some of our patients on what that means. So let's take a step back 30 years. And what do you think it took to convince people to, uh, that they thought it might be a good idea to burn a bunch of uh, lasers onto your eyeball to improve your vision? LASIK surgery is now a very common procedure. I think there's almost a million procedures happening a year. And it comes with risk, uh, and the risks are lower now over time, but um, what did it take? I mean, for a lot of the people getting LASIK surgery, you could just go and get glasses. You don't need to do that surgery, but people were still willing to take that risk to improve your vision. Why? Because you're having trouble interacting in the visual world, and that's important, and you want to have you want to be at full functioning of your visual system as you engage in the world. And there's a very different level of visual impairment that people make a decision to get LASIK surgery with. And some of it's reimbursable and some of it's not. The people we're trying to help are those who lose your ability to use your hands in the digital world. And this has become very relevant over the last 15 years. 15 years ago, smartphones did not exist. And you might remember Steve Jobs' presentation of the smartphone. The whole foundation of the smartphone was around using your finger to select certain areas on a touch screen. And that world is now advancing in a staggering rate. But you need your hands to participate in that world. 
And you know this because if you wake up in the morning and your phone is not within hand's reach, you have that little drive of dopamine, you suddenly freak out, where's my phone? I need to be within arm's reach of it. Unfortunately, unfortunately or unfortunately, that's the way we are now. And you conduct a huge proportion of your life on that phone. So for people who lose the ability to engage with these systems with the use of your hands, you get the sense of how big a problem this might be. We need our hands to participate in the digital world. So how did this begin? It started with a keyboard. We still use a keyboard, but what's happening is that the requirement of complex motor inputs into these systems is decreasing over time. You get more out of your system by doing less than you had to 10, 20 years ago, and it's going in that direction. So what's coming next is a world, and you're going to hear Andreas talk about this, but we saw Apple at the WWDC describe their Vision Pro technology. And unlike uh, Meta, who have been using muscle interfaces to engage in the, di in the digital ecosystem, Apple has taken a visual approach, and they're going to be using screens to record certain activities. If you remember Minority Report, the film with Tom Cruise, using the hands to swipe through, that's Apple's vision of how to control their visual, visual, uh, virtual reality headset. So we're in this place now where very small hand gestures can do a lot um, amplified through very complicated and smart digital systems. And so for the people in the world who have lost the ability to use their hands, this continues to be a big problem. So from the brain to the brainstem to the spinal cord, to the peripheral nerves, to the muscles, to the joints, you can now imagine that there is a very large amount of people who have an inability to control the digital ecosystem. We put it somewhere between 5 million for the severely impaired and around 100 million every year due to a range of conditions um, at the more mild side of impairment. And as technology improves, it becomes more and more challenging to keep up with the digital ecosystem. Okay, let's take a step back. I just want to explain how the motor system works and how we're thinking about the motor system and how we're talking to the FDA about what the motor system is. Actually, the, the first guidance document that the FDA put out didn't use the term motor impairment, it used the term paralysis. But paralysis is an um, impairment of your muscles to move, but the problem is bigger than that. So what is the motor system? The motor system is your ability to want or to have volition or to have will. That generates from the motor cortex. That signal gets carried down motor neurons. So ALS is a condition that affects the motor neurons through the spinal cord to the peripheral muscles, to the peripheral nerves, and then it eventually uses a muscle to control the things on your smartphone. Some of you are probably typing a message right now. That fails on many different points. And so we've been talking to the FDA about this technology is not going to solve any one of these conditions. It's actually a bypass for the system. This is a neuroprosthetic. It restores a lost bodily function. Similar to the way the cochlear device restores hearing through an implant into the brain, this technology restores your ability to have motor control over the world. And we're focusing initially on the digital ecosystem because it's so powerful. So my story, this is a picture from, uh, I think it was 2010. I was uh, still doing my neurology residency and I came to the US, I was still in Australia, and um, I, got very excited about, I had a background in electrophysiology, but got very, very excited about where the technology was moving with blood vessels into the brain. And I ended up coming to New York to took a fellowship at Mount Sinai in New York City uh, in the interventional um, domain on the Department of Neurosurgery. But before I came, I had this experience in Australia, in Melbourne, of a young man, I'm, I'm 42, this gentleman was 40 at the time, and he had a stroke. It was a tiny stroke. That little gray area is where the stroke was in the brain stem. The rest of the brain was totally fine. That's the pons, and it carries all of the messages out of the motor cortex of the body. He could, he could feel, he could see, he could smell, he could feel, he had emotion, he, everything else was going on in his brain, but he had, he had no ability to get the information out. So he couldn't control his muscles to talk, he couldn't control his arm muscles to move, he had a little bit of eye movement left. He chose not to live like that, and so we palliated him on the spot. He didn't, and he had, two, he had three kids, he had a marriage, he was a CEO of a young company. And I remember at the time watching my boss talk through what his future was and thinking that this, this is a problem that we have no solution for. Around that time, 2009, uh, Harvard through Lee Hochberg started presenting the first implantable brain computer um, interface technology published in Nature, um, and they were, needles put into the brain. 
And from that point, my journey started, and our whole idea was that you can do that through blood vessels into the brain without having to do open brain surgery. So fast forward to, um, this is Graham and his wife. This was the exact moment that he had our implanted system started spelling out a sentence where he was not able to do that previously. Um, and so this technology is helping people like Graham. Graham has ALS, but we've at this point implanted people with stroke and with ALS, and we're starting to build a simple technology that can enable patients, patients like Graham to recontrol access to their digital ecosystem. For him, that meant that his wife could leave the house because she had to otherwise be at his side the whole time. He was, we got him using WhatsApp, and he was able to send her a message so she could leave the house and go, to the, go and do the grocery shopping. So this is what the technology looks like. You have the brain signal coming out of the motor cortex. We have an implant. Um, there's, a, there's a device that sits in the chest that sends it out wirelessly, and we're building an app on various ecosystems. So the implanted section there on, on one side, in the middle is our, is our, it's about the size of an iPhone, it sends out a server and we're building an ecosystem with integrations to all of the platforms like Microsoft and Apple that you're aware of. The basis of our technology was built upon stent technology, which has been around since the 70s, really, and then the 80s. The idea that you can put a metal scaffold into the inside of a blood vessel and leave it there safely for a lifetime, like a tattoo under the skin. We have brought electronics into that domain. So we've taken stent technology and we've built electronics into it so we can deliver sensors inside the brain without having to do open brain surgery and um, enable uh, uh, all sorts of different interactions for our patients. So here's a quick video. There are sensors on the stent sitting inside the blood vessel in between the two motor cortices inside the brain, a cable coming down through the natural exit point of the ve venous system in the brain, and then we have some devices in the chest that enable the power, their wireless communication. This is what the blood vessels of the brain look like, um, particularly the veins. So you can see there's a huge network, like a tree, that reaches all corners of the brain. And this is one of our patients. Actually, this was a case done at Mount Sinai. Um, and I just wanted to give you a sense of what the procedure looks like. The, play, the patient's lying flat. They're under general anesthesia. You can see the hands are gently pushing forward the device. And the catheter, you can see, it's kind of tricky to see in the top, but the catheter, if the video is playing, is it? Yep. And the catheter is starting to move back. What you can't see is the stent opening up. We haven't made it very visible yet. That's a big problem. Um, and so as the catheter is coming back, the device opens up, and it's there sitting there inside the blood vessel near the region of the brain that controls your intended movements. Now, we've tried to keep... We want the training to be very low. We've, we've taken a design approach that is simplicity, longevity, and stability. And so um, our patients know how to... Now, they can't tap their foot because their nervous system doesn't work, but they can think about tapping their foot. They can think about waving their hand, moving their fingers, opening, closing their hand. And we decode all those into different um, signatures. And we build algorithms that can predict different types of movements, and we convert those into use cases that can control technology. This is a gentleman who, um, again, this is one of our Mount Sinai patients in New York. Uh, this happened a few weeks back, and I just wanted to show you this is an example. So this gentleman is in his home. He's fortunately uh, very wealthy, so he's been able to set himself up at home despite his progressive ALS. This man is an incredible energy. He's, he was told that he was, should be, have passed away 10 years ago, and he continues to fight on. Um, like Stephen Hawking has taken every possible opportunity to remain alive and has a huge hunger for life. So he's at home, he's in, he's in Upper East Side, he's set up at home, but he's, unable, he's only able to slightly move his eyes, and he needs a caregiver to be by his side at all times. So we have converted some of those fundamental units. We've converted it um, over a wireless technology, and you're going to see him sending out a health report using um, an iPhone. So we're building out applications on an iPhone that en enable him to function completely independently. And Nita's about to grill me on ethics. I just want to make the point in this moment, this gentleman, um, privacy is a big thing for him. When you're in that state, you don't have privacy anymore because you need someone beside you at every single moment to be able to engage. He's now got, he can be left alone and work through his iPhone. It's slow right now for this first generation system, but just to give you a sense of what it's like going from zero to one. So he's navigating through the system, he's making selections and he's going to send out a health report that previously he would have required someone else to interpret for him.
He's got a little bit of um, mouth movement left, and you're going to see at the end of this demo that this was, this was one of the first um, sessions. He was using this almost straight away once the system was activated. And you'll see at the end, there's people in the background getting a bit excited, and he smi you see a little tiny smile come up on the corner of his mouth, which was an incredible moment for our team. I think it comes up. Yeah. That, uh, we, we spend a lot of time with our patients in the homes, and it's, we get very close to them, and it, it becomes very, and I'm sure Andreas is going to talk about this as well, but these little moments are what are driving our whole team to keep going forward. So um, we will be implanting our 10th patient in Mount Sinai in a couple of weeks. Not, not me, but the Mount Sinai neurosurgery team. Um, that will take us up to the end of the feasibility stage. and so. Um, where we're headed now is, you know, you saw that on iPhone, so we're building out integrations that enable this technology to be generalizable and, and widely used. And we're excited about technology like what Andreas is building, what Apple is building, because we're building a very simple platform and trying to give our patients access to all of the systems that we all take for granted. Where we're at along this journey, there are about um, five companies uh, out there in the implantable brain computer interface space. There's a long history that you can read about of the US government funding this, particularly DARPA, who also did GPS and internet. They, they made the initial investment, that's why I moved to the US. Um, and they have a very active program that are creating a pathway through. So we're ending the feasibility stage and moving in towards pivotal stage and are uh, ramping up for a um, pivotal study. Uh, the pivotal study is going to be about 30 sites across the US. Uh, Mount Sinai has been one of those core sites, and uh, Dr. Davis is here, the CEO of Mount Sinai. We thank you for your um, collaboration. It's been a wonderful relationship, and we're looking forward to the next steps. And so just to finish, I, I wanted to take you on this journey because I think people think about this technology as in the realm of science fiction or away from what you might need. But as we age and as we get older and as we take injuries in our bodies, I was thinking the other morning, you know, uh, I wonder what, what, what the debate was when the original knee orthotic implants, the, the metal knee replacements came in. And if you have a neuroethical conversation about, well, what are the implications about where this is going, there's a tendency to think far ahead about what the challenges are going to be on a wide scale. And I'm not going to diminish them, we're about to talk about them, but um, you get a knee replacement because your knee stopped working. And so this technology is about restoring your ability to engage in the world, and that's, that's what this is about. Thank you. I'm um, happy to uh, have the conversation now, and thank you for having us. I am not here to grill you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start there. But um, first, uh, thank you for uh, you know, the incredible work that you're doing to enable people to give them hope um, part of why Tom thinks I might grill him is I've written a book that just came out in March called The Battle for Your Brain, Defending the Right to Think Freely in the Age of Neurotechnology. Because this technology, I think, is extraordinarily promising and can empower humanity. Um, it can empower the people that you were just talking about. It can be much more broadly applicable, but it comes with risks, right? The decoding of our brains and mental experiences, the kind of final frontier of privacy, is a little Orwellian and Black Mirror, as you said. But I want to get into the, some of that for, with you. I know you've been thinking deeply about these issues. And I want to start with this idea that you and I have talked about a lot, which is this idea of cognitive liberty. And what that means is kind of a framework moving forward. So cognitive liberty is a human rights framework as a way to recognize for individuals a right to self-determination, to access information, and to change their brains if they choose to do so, but also a right from interference with their mental privacy and freedom of thought. Um, and I want to start with the right to aspect of it and ask you know, how you've been thinking about mm. what you're doing, how this fits in you know, as an ethical mandate in society as well. Mm. Yeah, so I think the contribution, so Nita gave a wonderful TED talk at TED a couple of months back. And when I first heard about your book and read about your concepts, I think the idea of cognitive liberty encompassing both right from the protections, but also the right to, is I think the right to component, I think from, from the patient community that I'm exposed to is a little bit ignored. And I think part of that is uh, there are some other entrepreneurs out there who are talking about BCI as the 
you know, we, we talked about transhumanism a little bit. Not to bit. name names, right? Well, not to yeah. name names, but there's an idea that BCI is going to be the solution for the impending war with the, with the robotic overlords that are coming, and we have to keep evolving. And so that's really hard to hear for patients with severe disability who are looking to regain their autonomy. Yeah. So I think the principle of self-determination, I think, becomes really important. And I just gave the example of what it, no, it, what it might be like to actually have uh, your privacy, your ability to um, express yourself, which is a, a fundamental human right, taken away, and that this technology uh, can restore that. Not, I'm not diminishing the fact that there is potentially a tipping point where this goes into wider use, and there are definitely privacy issues, but as an early guiding principle and the basis for the risk-benefit determination in our conversations with FDA, the question is how much, uh, how much restored independence can this technology provide you if you lose it? I think that's one of the things that often gets lost in conversations about ethics, is people think of ethics and responsible innovation as guardrails, rather than also the ethical mandates we have in society to actually address some of the leading causes of suffering for people who've lost the ability to communicate, to speak, to engage and have independence in the world. Um, but you mentioned the privacy issues, which uh, obviously I think are profound not just for the device, but also for the research that you push forward and what it is that you can actually decode from the brain, right? So it's not just the individuals who gain access to implanted neurotechnology, it's what you can actually decode and how that has broader translation across society. And so, you know, a lot of people I'm sure have heard about the calls to pause AI and the kind of existential risks and threats from AI. But AI is also deeply enabling in what it can decode and patterns that it can decode. So maybe talk a little bit about um, what exactly, like you showed some examples of moving through text messages, but what's the you know, kind of future or the limits or what you see as possible to decode from the brain? Mm. And how much does what you're doing push forward this merger between AI and neurotechnology to enable much greater brain transparency? Mm. So at the, at the TED conference, um, the president of OpenAI got up um, mm -hmm. and gave a talk about how the only way to understand what AI is is to release it into the world. And then neurotechnology was kind of positioned against that, and they seem to be two technologies that are being talked about a lot from an ethical principle. But there's, there's one fundamental difference from, from an implantable brain-computer interface perspective. That is that the FDA is strictly regulating our um, development, and that's not happening in AI because there is no regulatory yep. body. Yep. So we have a framework, and, and we're working with the FDA on issues of, of cybersecurity. Now, I'm not saying that we've figured everything out, but um, privacy is a major issue, and cybersecurity is a major issue, and we're working through what that looks like. Um, well, but I, but I want to push you a little bit on well, I didn't what can you question. decode. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, okay. so, so I was just framing it that way. So yeah. with that in mind, that, that, I guess the reason I was framing it that way is because the FDA is saying to us, you know, they really constrain the problem. And they say, where in the brain are you going? Mm -hmm. What's it going to do? Who's it going to help? Mm -hmm. And then we have to do everything through that lens. So in terms of what you can predict through the brain, science is now showing, particularly with Eddie Chang's work at UCSF, that you can decode, um, you can decode thought, you can decode ideas, you can... Um, you, uh, Yes, it's all happening in your brain and it's measurable. And up to this point, we've had a challenge in doing that because the skull is here, but now there are emer emerging technologies. So that's all possible. But um, for, the, for the short term, I think the FDA's approach is, well, let's just remain in one constrained area and see if we can make progress there. So um, from our perspective, we're only decoding, you know, did you intend to move your hand or not? So from a security point of view, it's like... But presumably you're also hoping to enable people to be able to type by thinking about the words rather than just moving the cursor. Like it, the, the well, idea would potentially I, be not just movement and simple, simple motor activity, but the ability to actually take thought, translate it from the brain and I mean, express it in the world. That is not like on our, on our trajectory right now. That's not, I'm, I'm not building that technology. I'm building a technology that helps you move a cursor around a screen to select things. Now, it's out there, that, that technology, but uh, that feels like a long way away for me, for what we're doing and where we are. Do you feel like it's a long way away from the implanted neurotechnology world? Um, uh, I, th I think it's on the horizon. Um, I guess the point I was going to make is that if we, we've constrained the problem initially to being in the motor system. So from a cybersecurity point of view, it would be the same as 
having someone hack your mouse and knowing where you're clicking. Yeah. Which, so, you know, uh, yeah, but uh, yes. Well, so, let, so let's take that and build that. So recognizing that your particular technology, neurotechnology in general, implanted neurotechnology, speech prosthesis that you referred to, um, is seeking to decode far more than just motor cortex activity or motor activity. Um, but given the constraints that you've placed on how you're thinking about the problem right now, what do you see as the biggest risk from a privacy perspective? You mentioned the patient that you put up, uh, that he cares deeply about his privacy. And so from a mental privacy perspective, what do you feel like is being revealed or potentially at risk of being revealed um, where the sensitivity of the data is something that you have to balance and figure out who has access to that information, who is using that information, how are they using that information? Well, I mean, so if you were to ask Graham, um, how would you, how would you, so right, let, let's take a patient who's unable to communicate at all, and then you say, okay, you can have a technology that's going to predict where you want to move, but there's a chance that could get, I, I, guess, I guess where you're coming from is that there's a biosecu you can get hacked, right? Is that where you're going? No, I'm not going anywhere. I'm asking you to go somewhere with <laughs> well, us. No, so, I mean, you've, you've been thinking about these issues, right? Yeah. And, well, and I mean, the idea, it's deeply enabling for someone to be able to have their thoughts, their intention to move, re-enabled, right. um, but it also means decoding the space inside the skull that we have always assumed is our last fortress of privacy. For the people who are willingly choosing to have implanted neurotechnology, yeah. their concerns about that are far less. They want right. to get those signals right, out, right, right. right? I mean, that's, that's the hope is to get those signals out. Yes. The question is what risks, not just for that individual patient, but more societal risks of thinking about the ability to decode motor cortex activity from the brain, applying AI to this problem in particular, which is decoding yeah, yeah. specific neural signals. Like, what risk does that present? And how are you thinking about that? We yeah. know that from the AI world, uh, as you just said, right, part of the approach is to say, well, let's release it in the wild and see what the risks are. Mm. I know from conversation with you that you're thinking much more deeply proactively and in advance about what some of those risks are. So I'm asking mm. you to share, mm. you know, kind of your thinking about what are the real risks, right? Not existential risks that people talk about to deflect and avoid regulatory oversight. But what do you see as the immediate near term risks um, that this kind of implanted neurotechnology poses? One is hacking that you've mentioned, which are, you know, kind of robust cybersecurity measures are needed. Do you think that just on balance, the privacy risks are so de minimis compared to the enablement of self-determination that they're not something to worry about? I do. I mean, I think in the short term, that, that is how I think about it. And yeah. I know in, in our conversations with the FDA, like we've really constrained this problem down. And so from a patient perspective, I think, I think where, you, where you were just going at the end there is how I'm thinking about it. I think you, you take the patient's perspective, you look at risk and reward, and you say you've returned privacy from a global sense, and yes, there is some risk around biosecurity, and we have to put things in place for that. But from a patient perspective, you know, it's kind of like, do you want to, well, that, no, I'm not going to use the Facebook example. Um, but I, I think as, as things grow, um, and Andreas, Andreas is talking about this a little bit as well, and at Apple's um, WWDC, they were talking about security a lot. And one thing that I think will keep happening is putting algorithms, um, localized algorithms, securing algorithms locally. Mm -hmm. Apple, Apple are talking about this, so on-device learning. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big security measure. I think if th the more interactions there are with the cloud is a much bigger cybersecurity risk. So I think localizing things, building personalized AIs that know what you want to do, when you want to do it, and are sort of stuck on your system with end-to-end -end encry encryption, I think that's the pathway we'll be going. Okay, now I have two more questions for you before we're gonna move on to hearing from Andreas about a kind of broader application potentially beyond this patient population. One is a lot of people talk about race for technology against other countries. Um, and the US government has uh, kind of circled around concerns about a race in the brain computer interface space with China. Um, how are you thinking about those risks uh, from a corporate perspective? Do you think that those are real concerns um, you know, what, what's on your mind with respect to that? I thought you weren't going to ask that. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so, well, it's, it's public. So the Department of Commerce called all industry leaders from BCI uh, a couple of months ago to DC to talk about 
um, security risks, and not security, I think ex export control. The space industry has huge export control risks um, because you know, all the supply chain has to be eradicated um, from any engagement of, of bad actors internationally. Uh, so the question came at us, when is BCI going to be weaponized? And it, all of the BCI leaders were very focused on a medical application and you know, seeing that it's, it's, it's possible that there's gonna go down that pathway. Um, I'm not naive, like the US Defense Agency has put hundreds of millions of dollars into neurotechnology, so I think there is a broad national view that this technology has a national strategic interest. I think it's very early in the days of this technology, and now. Well, let me, let me pick uh, up on that for this right. last question, which is, um, you know, part of the investments that the US government has been making is looking at national security potential. And, you know, you hear this mantra from Neuralink and, um, you know, kind of others in the space about enabling far more than the patient population that you're talking about, right? That it's uh, brain computer interface could potentially unlock potential for all of humanity to be able to move beyond the constraints of our bodies to do far more. And so as somebody who has come up with a much more innovative approach, this tells me that we're out of time, much more innovative approach, this is just a yes, no, it's a little bit easy for you, which is, would you imagine in your lifetime having the Synchron device implanted in yourself or a different one if it wasn't your company, presumably it'd be yours, but yeah. I've thought, I have thought about this and I think if, if the technology's safe and I'm satisfied with the security issues, and it helps me not have to touch the device all the time, and it frees you up a little bit, I think I, think I, would, I would consider having one. Um, yeah, which is pretty incredible, right? Because that tells you that the potential for this technology goes well beyond necessarily the patient population that we're talking about at the outset, and that the research and where it's going really could unlock potential for um, a much broader set of people raising both the possibilities, but also the extraordinary risks uh, to mental privacy and self-determination. So Tom, thank you for this. We're gonna have more time that we will have Q&A at the end of all this, where I know uh, that folks out there who are looking captivated by your work will have questions, but I wanna turn to introducing our next speaker, um, which is Andreas Forslin. And uh, I first encountered Andreas um, more than a year ago uh, as he was working on taking this kind of extraordinary hope and potential of being able to enable people who've lost the ability to communicate, who've lost the ability to move, and finding a way that doesn't use implanted neurotechnology as assistive technology, using the brain and the signals that are harder to detect or noisier through the skull, um, and using something like an augmented reality device to be able to uh, navigate with the outside world. And if you just think about that presentation and also the recent announcement from Apple ProVision and the kind of growing use of sensors, you can see both the extraordinary potential that Andreas is gonna talk about, but also the possibilities of this application as a wearable technology reaching all of us much sooner than that. So with no further ado, I'll hand it over to Andreas. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Bechtel. We look through the long lens to make heads or tails of where the world's headed to harness tailwinds, dodge headwinds, and arrive at our preferred tomorrows ever so slightly ahead of schedule. This is Brief Histories of the Future. Welcome to the Brief Histories of the Future. Andreas, I, it's such a pleasure to have you here today. I'm so impressed with your mashup of brain-computer interfaces, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality wearables. What are you guys cooking? Well, uh, we're cooking up essentially a way that people can interact with the world in entirely different ways. Uh, we think about it not as AR, as an augmented reality, but we think about it as an assisted reality. So thinking about assisted reality is this idea of augmented reality with useful applications um, that can support you in the moment so that you know it's aware of your environment and what you're trying to do and helps you do things with less effort. So when we think about this, we've been mostly focused on helping people uh, that need it the most, uh, so individuals that might have a disability. The trigger that got me into this thinking about it and sort of the burning fire, and that had to do when my mom uh, went into the hospital with pneumonia. I had to communicate with the nurses and everyone that was providing care on her behalf, even though she was alert and awake. It was at that moment when I realized how precious communication is. 
Andreas, how big is the disabled population? Well, the disabled population today uh, is about 15% of the world's population, or 1 billion people. So if you forecast out 30, 40 years from now, we're going to see a massive senior population, right? So more people will be in their hundreds. We call it the silver tsunami, where you have this emergent need uh, for caregiver support and accessibility. So from birth to death for individuals with disabilities, plus everyone else, healthy individuals who just age naturally. There's going to be a lot of people that need some kind of augmentation. We're doing something that uh, people can put on their head and it can monitor brain waves in real time within the headset. Not only can I interact with the content using my mental fixation. Okay. Uh, and mental fixation means? Yeah, a really simplistic example is if I had four boxes in front of me that were holograms, I could tell you very, very fast through your brain waves which of those four items you're paying attention to. What are some examples of what comes next? You know, you think about this into, into the 2100 and even beyond, where truly our experience of the world is going to be totally different. Uh, think about smart cities, think about 5G, 6G, 7G, 8G, right? Think about the speed at which things can happen at the edge. Then you have the super dynamic interface where the human is actually part of the city, it's part of the built environment, right? So the built environment itself becomes sort of quasi-digital in the sense that I can now interact with things, robots, public transit, um, people. I can communicate in English and I can display it in Chinese. You can truly get to the point where you have telepathic connections with other people, like your squad, your friends, right? And most of the world will say that's impossible. But guess what? It's impossible until it's possible. Right? And we want to be at the front end of that. Think about this. If we can employ 100 million people with disabilities using cognition technology, and they could generate an income of $20,000 each, that's a $2 trillion in increase wow. to GDP. Sure. Right? And that's within reach. There's a real rising tide raising all boats story. Because as you said, if the GDP is improving, if there's a meaningful economic impact, um, everybody wins. So this is, this is really assisting everyone by assisting those who need it most. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, hopefully, can you hear me in the back? Just a quick, cool, awesome. Um, well, I just wanted to uh, introduce myself. My name is Andreas Forsland. <laughs> the video helped introduce me. But um, uh, like we said, we're, uh, let me if I can get this slide up here. Oop, sorry. Um, so that's the purpose of cognition is essentially designed uh, to unlock self-expression and independence for 100 million people. I'll talk a little bit more about how we're going to go about doing that. Um, but for framing, for those of you who aren't aware, you know, if you sort of distill down into the disabilities market, it's extremely fragmented. It's very much segmented. Um, but cumulatively, uh, there's almost 2 billion people, actually, that have some form of disability. But it's quite complicated. You have vision, hearing, cognitive, motor, um, behavioral. So there's many different kinds of conditions. And they're all on spectrums from severe to mild. And so, but when you look at that, we're thinking about self-determination. <clears throat> more and more, at least in the United States, there are more programs that are starting to be put in place where individuals with disabilities can uh, make their own choices. So as you age up and become adults, they can make more choices around where their funding goes and the types of things that they spend money on. So what we're seeing is an emergence of the importance of accessibility. So you're seeing all of the major corporations are starting to prioritize accessibility, um, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's also an economically beneficial way to make sure that your technologies and products and services are relevant for an emerging market opportunity. <clears throat> So to unpack, uh, we're focused on speech and motor disabilities, and here's a chart that shows you some of the conditions of individuals that we work with. There's literally hundreds of millions of people that are represented here. <clears throat> uh, but when we think about the role of a wearable ex assistive technology like what we've created, everyone on here, uh, it's sort of a great leveling. The, the wearable prosthetic is a platform that's not specifically isolated to ALS or to one of these conditions, which is today's world. Most uh, technologies are isolated isolated to one community or the other, and so we're taking much more of a platform approach. Um, and what we've done is we've gone into uh, a lot of deep human factors research, comorbidities, and science to understand what are the shared needs, human factors needs, mind-body needs, um, quality of life needs, social sphere needs, and, and really got down to some first principles around how could we develop one technology from a hardware perspective that could be deeply personalized for each individual through the software. And that's kind of how AI can play a role in personalizing this capability, depending on where you are. I'm going to zoom in to ALS, because we talked about that uh, a little bit. Thanks, Tom, for teeing that up. For those of you who 
aren't aware of ALS, it's a progressive condition <clears throat> that essentially deteriorates your uh, nervous system. Uh, and so what that means is gradually over time, you stop uh, being able to use things that we assume. So you might have a start at the beginning on the right side of the slide or the left side of the slide where we're healthy and then we're diagnosed. And then there's a bit of a glide path where um, at some point our lower trunk uh, is uh, difficult to walk and you're identifying wheelchair solutions. And then later uh, you have difficulty speaking uh, and then you're starting to look for assistive technology like mobile apps or other kinds of things uh, for assistive speech and communication. At some point, individuals are going to start looking for ways to have smart home controls because they need to be able to do things independently. Um, and then at some point, uh, breathing becomes quite difficult uh, to control. So they have to make a life and death choice of are they going to get a tracheotomy or not. <clears throat> and then pretty much from that point, if they get a trach, <clears throat> they can live a very long time. Um, but the challenge with that is you get a trach and then your ocular motor starts to fail and then you're effectively locked in. And so anyone around you is not really able to detect what you're trying, your intentions are. So you saw the little smile that Tom shared, which is a very subtle uh, sort of body uh, language cue that someone would need to know how to read. And if you're in a healthcare facility, you have nurses that are run rotating. These nurses don't necessarily have the time to spend with you in skilled nursing to really understand your peculiar communication needs, right? So it's imperative to be able to provide access so that people that have limited access to healthcare nurses, uh, professional caregiving, that they can do things on their own, whether that's at home or in a professional environment. <laughs> and then to the point where ocular motor uh, starts to decline to the point where uh, the current state of technology, the state of the art is eye tracking. Uh, essentially, everyone with ALS eye tracking fails at some point. And then they're left with anywhere from six months to two to three years unable to access the world. And that's really where we see the opportunity to integrate brain computer interface as a wearable, <clears throat> as a way to uh, enable someone to get in, start using their brain as a control interface. But you see these little red dots on the bottom. Our system includes head tracking. So at the earliest stage, you can start to move your head around to control AR applications hands-free. And then when you can no longer have cervical control, you can switch to eye tracking. And then when you can no longer use eye tracking, you can switch to the brain. So in one system, because we wanted to really follow the patient journey end to end so that it can provide value all the way through. So how do we extend these abilities? <clears throat> so when we talk about realizing this vision, we sort of really isolated what we're doing to this notion of BCI with augmented reality as a combined system. So eliminating all these extra computers that are either out of sight or out of reach and bringing the compute and the display right to your face. <clears throat> And then the notion of bringing those sensors directly onto the skin, onto the scalp, uh, so that that system from an electrical perspective is one system, it's closed loop, if you will. Um, so what's the role of AI, right? We were talking a little bit about AI. Um, and many people think about AI as, I might type in a prompt into a GPT model and it spits out an essay, <laughs> right? Um, but that's kind of, there's time lag in that, right? When we're trying to create a real-time communication prosthesis, it needs to move very fast. So it means that all the AI has to be on the device in order for it to know you as you're learning it uh, and for that to be hyper secure. So what you see here is essentially a closed loop system, which is what we call adaptive AI. So at Cognition, we've created our own um, AI that runs language models on the device uh, and it allows you to, um, over time, every time you use it to communicate, it starts to learn your vernacular. So if you have a certain kind of way of talking to your friends versus talking in a professional way, it understands that sort of semantic variation. Uh, it also understands time of day and types of communications at different stages. Uh, also understands location and if you're going to communicate a particular way at home versus at a doctor's office. Um, so really we're thinking about this as a wearable speech generating device um, that can be augmented so it adapts to you as you're learning to adapt to it. Um, I have a note here about an API because <clears throat> Though we have a BCI on it, EEG is the technology we use, which is notoriously noisy, so we have to do some pretty aggressive signal processing on the device to make it work quickly and accurately. Um, but we do know that there are aspects from a motor function perspective that we can't solve with this configuration, because we're looking at the visual cortex and what you're paying attention to visually, where what Tom is doing is on the motor, which is on the top of the head. So this is an opportunity potentially for biometric sensor fusion at some point in the future, Uh, all right. 
Where are we? Okay. I'm seeing different slides. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to show you a little bit about here was this is an early stage uh, example of one of our ALS patients. So she's early stage. This is, she's right around the point where she's lost her ability to communicate verbally, but she still has cervical control. So what she's doing is she's actually using uh, a heads up augmented reality, like a holographic keyboard in front of herself. And we've also integrated Amazon Alexa inside so that she can communicate with people around her and she could actually control everything around her. So whether that's controlling the lights, playing music, setting timers, reminders, sending out uh, uh, an order to Prime to say, you know, refill my dog food order, you know, whatever it is you want to do to be able to have independence and agency within the AR environment. So at this point, she's controlling this with head motion. But you see that little blob uh, in the lower right there, the black uh, graph. Um, so that's essentially a TensorFlow diagram of her language, right? So you look at someone's actual corpus, uh, and over time, your corpora changes, and it adapts from a language model perspective. So this corpora actually runs on device, and it's deeply personalized into the firmware of the system. Um, this is an example of someone that is mid-stage, or this is a simulation of someone in mid-stage using the system purely with BCI. Um, And so what's happening is this is around visual fixation. So what this person is doing is they're visually fixating. So even if they can't move their eyes, like eye tracking to point at a particular object, they can just look straight ahead. Within their FOV or their field of view, they can determine which object you're paying attention to. And the software can send a selection to that. And so what we've done is we've created a constrained keyboard that's designed specifically for BCI. And this is where as your um, physical needs decline, the role of AI steps in. And so the AI is running in the background, predicting uh, situationally aware prompts that would be appropriate based on the inputs that you're having. And then in the very latest stage, um, this is uh, uh, an individual who is uh, uh, end state locked in, completely locked in, unable to control eye movement. Uh, and we can, in the software within the interface, uh, we can switch it over to just a simple yes, no keyboard with a relaxation interface. And so, uh, and we've been testing this see if we can get this going so you can see it. There we go. So this is an individual who can't move a single muscle and is able to yes. actually interact with and respond to closed inquiries. No. We've also integrated double confirmations that that was their intended action with a hover state. So we're actually innovating on the user interface to ensure that the user is intending to it. So if there's a highlight state and that wasn't their intention, they can refocus their mind on another one it will, and it will deselect and reselect another one. <clears throat> so this is just the beginning. Um, so if you look at the little red dots here, this represents what we call the beginning of assisted reality, uh, where we're focused on by like, uh, prostheses, so augmenting someone's ability to communicate, uh, in, uh, allowing for smart home controls, allowing for potentially mobility controls to control power wheelchairs and mobility, um, and being able to have an uh, com uh, AI companion built in, right, for loneliness or depression or just a task rabbit to get things done. Uh, if you look at the future beyond that, our company's currently operating in what's called durable medical equipment. Um, so that's our first market opportunity. But we envision that there are diagnostic and therapeutic opportunities represented in the blue dots above, um, such as remote diagnostics, telehealth, and eventually this could become a wearable clinic uh, where you could take the clinic out into the field, drop ship a clinic to someone, and you would no longer need to bring uh, patients to very expensive care facilities. Um, so by 2030, the company is trying to reach 100 million people um, and allowing them to be fully self-expressed with cognition technology. We also understand that there's a social impact uh, that <clears throat> uh, has a cascading effect, right? So by being off, able to offer accessible communication means and more agency for the individual, you see a cascading positive impact to quality of life, uh, reduction in anxiety in the, in the nuclear family, uh, and the ability to provide more agency as a functional individual. Uh, for some individuals, they've had uh, vibrant careers, and so they could use our technology to even extend their employability, uh, even through uh, various disabilities. So that's, uh, that's it.
I'll come back for you at the end for everybody. Um, so that's pretty incredible, right? Just uh, you know, start to see the spectrum and start to see the different areas of the brain that are being decoded by these technologies. Um, but it isn't just reading the brain and enabling people to get information from their brain out into the world. It's also writing back to the nervous system that a lot of the most extraordinary advances are enabling. Again, starting with therapeutic potential. So this next speaker, uh, Kate Rosenbluth, is going to talk with you about the extraordinary innovations that they've made in neural stimulation and how that's transforming lives for people with essential tumor and with Bar Parkinson's disease and the possibility of providing much more more precise therapeutics that are targeted to the nervous system disorders uh, and disabilities that people are struggling with. So with no further ado, uh, Kate Rosenbluth. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for this next segment, we're going to take the conversation in a bit of a different direction, as Nita laid out which is instead of talking about use of electrical signals to record and, de and decode the brain, we're gonna take it in the direction of using electrical signals to actually treat the brain. So this who you see here, this is Jeannie. You wouldn't know it from this picture, but Jeannie actually struggles with severe hand tremors from a disease called essential tremor. Ordinarily, there's no way she could you know, hold up a bubble wand to blow bubbles with her grandson. She wouldn't be able to stick the bubble wand in that tiny uh, container that he's holding. But now she can, and the reason for it is the prescription therapy, the medical device she's wearing on her wrist. I'm wearing one here as well. This is a prescription therapy. It is regulated by the FDA. Uh, and in this uh, device, uh, this is indicated both for the treatment of essential tremor as well as hand tremor in Parkinson's disease. I'm a neuroscientist and engineer uh, and the inventor of this therapy. So why do patients like Jeannie struggle so much with everyday tasks that we really take for granted, like the ability, as you can see here, or inability to drink a cup of coffee, to lift that cup without spilling the liquid inside of it? The culprit is the brain region shown here. It's in the center of the brain, it's called the thalamus, or if you want to be more technical about it, we're specifically talking about a nucleus called the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus. And it's basically the super highway where sensory information is coming in from the periphery, and it's a super highway that's then transmitting those signals up uh, to the motor control areas of the brain. So the tricky thing for treating diseases like essential tremor and, and uh, action tremor and Parkinson's is how do you treat this location in the brain? Well, I'm guessing one of the first things that you might think about would be drugs, pharmaceuticals. However, if you go and you start asking patients uh, with these conditions what drugs they're taking, you might start to notice that they're naming drugs that were developed to treat epilepsy and seizures or hypertension. And none of these drugs were actually developed to treat hand tremors. In fact, no therapy ever developed for essential tremor has made it through all of the clinical studies and made it to market. And the reason is that, the reason really is that drugs bathe the entire brain. And this is a challenge not only for this condition, but for many other neurologic conditions as well. And that's because the brain is such an exquisitely tuned organ where different parts of the brain perform different functions, but they all use the same basic building blocks. So I think a great example of this actually is the relationship between Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia. So Parkinson's is driven by a lack of dopamine. Parkinson's patients develop rigidity, tremor, uh, gait challenges, many, a, a whole host of other issues. On the other hand, you have a disease like schizophrenia that causes hallucinations and is actually caused by an overabundance of dopamine, among other things. So the challenging for taking pharmacologic approaches to treating these diseases is if you take a patient with Parkinson's and you give them too much dopamine, they'll start developing hallucinations. But if you take a patient who has schizophrenia and you give them antidopaminergic agents, they'll start developing Parkinsonian symptoms like rigidity. So this is really the fundamental reason that no drugs for essential tremor have ever yet made it through. The, the balance of risks and benefits is simply not there. Electricity, on the other hand, is highly targeted and a great way to approach diseases like tremor. The challenge is that it has required brain surgery. So here's an x-ray of an image with a deep brain stimulator implanted. You can see the patient's uh, teeth over on the lower uh, right and then their skull. And you'll notice two wires that are going down into the thalamus. So this is deep brain stimulation and it is incredibly effective in treating hand tremor. 
The downside is that it requires drilling a hole in the skull, running that wire you know, down to a battery pack and plant it in the chest wall. And these are common conditions. More than 8 million Americans have essential tremor, more than 30 million worldwide. So deep brain stimulation simply isn't a reasonable solution given the size of this problem. So what alternatives are there? Well, one alternative could be to go into, through the blood vessels, uh, as Tom and his amazing team at Synchron are doing. I'd say the thalamus would be a really challenging location to get to, but they seem pretty much uh, capable of, of, of doing anything. The approach that uh, we took was really to go back to neuroscience principles. And that's starting with the recognition that the brain, the nervous system, this is primarily built, it is purpose-built, to carry electrical signals. So in this tractography image, this is actually tracing the neural pathways, the projections from the thalamus in the brain. And what we realized was that if you could put essentially the right cars on the right lane of this superhighway with the right timing at the right moment, you should be able to treat the thalamus. You can almost think of this as using the neurons, using those long skinny cells, their axons, as the wires that are implanted in the brain. And what's beautiful about this approach is that you can actually do this from the peripheral nervous system. You can do this from the wrist. And while this might seem like a bit of a crazy idea, uh, functional neurosurgeons have been actually using this trick for dec decades. So if you're implanting a deep brain stimulator, you basically have the brain. It's roughly the size and weight of a cantaloupe, about three pounds. And you're implanting a needle, and you're trying to find something in the brain that's roughly the size of a grain of sand. You need sub-millimeter precision. That's incredibly hard to do. And so the way that it's done is through, uh, is through uh, approaches like sweeping the hand and actually listening for the sound of that sensory input into the brain. Because once you hear that sound, you've actually found the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus. So we said, why can't we take an idea like that, a diagnostic concept, and actually apply it therapeutically? And we can stimulate here at the wrist because this, the nerves that carry the sensory input from the hand actually pass right under the skin here, close to the carpal tunnel. So in this location, we could actually both measure people's tremor in order to time the stimulation appropriately and also deliver therapy. And that's what makes it possible for Jeannie to get back to blowing bubbles with her grandson, as well as to do things like to eat, to drink, to write. You know, as Tom really beautifully laid out, how we use our hands, our motor control, is really critical to our dignity, to how we interact with the world. This emerging field is called bioelectronic medicine. There's a lot more coming in it. And it's really about identifying the areas where we understand the precise timing, as well as location that's needed for these electrical inputs into the body. So let's review for a moment how this therapy works. So as noted here, this is peripheral stimulation worn on the wrist. That applies, that applies a signal sent to the same location in the brain as deep brain stimulation. The therapy is individualized. That's because patients' hand tremors are very different. Some patients' hands shake roughly three times faster than other patients, and therefore the signal into their brain needs to be three times faster as well. So this device sends, sends signal um, up the median and, and radial nerve, up into the brain, and the effect of that is actually to dephase the tremor signal to interrupt it in the brain. This has been clinically validated across many studies. Uh, a single session is about 40 minutes, but patients can do many sessions throughout the day. They get therapy for, they get a benefit, I should say, for roughly an hour after their sessions. Um, numerous publications, I'll circle back on those in a moment. And really importantly, this is easy. It's easy for a physician to prescribe, it's easy for a, a patient to put on and wear and use at home. And this gets back to, really restoring patients' ability to do what matters most in their daily lives. Over a thousand patients have participated uh, in studies on this technology to date, including randomized clinical trials, studies on health economics, societal input. Just to highlight a couple pieces here, this is a really nice uh, perspective in The Lancet uh, just earlier this year, really detailing out these ideas around using digital medicine to both detect as well as to treat conditions like tremor. In a study that was of roughly a, um, a couple of tens of thousands of individual sessions performed by hundreds of patients over multiple months of use, uh, the study showed that nine out of 10 patients improved, and really importantly, 68% of the patients who were rated moderate or severe in their ability to do things like eat, drink, and write, that basically means they can only do it either with great difficulty or can't do it at all, were rated mild or better by the end of the three months of the study. 
Here's an example from a different publication of a spiral drawn by a patient, an Archimedes spiral drawn before and after stimulation. And of course, what matters here is not whether a patient can draw a spiral. What matters most is the actual impact that neurotech like this has on patients' lives. So with that, let's hear uh, from a user of this therapy. Calitrio has changed my life, and it even brings tears to my eyes. It has made such a difference in my life. Being able to read without the book shaking all over the place, um, feeling more secure cooking using a knife. Really one of the best parts is being able to eat and drink without having um, a tsunami in my cup and not having food fall off my fork. It's just so nice to be able to go about my normal business knowing that I'm not going to be trembling the way that I had prior. It's an amazing, amazing medical device. I want to spread the word because it is so effective. My prayer is that many people will come to know about Cala and Cala Trio. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's really, I mean, it's really inspiring to see the impact that, that neurotech can have on people, you know, on their ability to live with dignity, with things that so many of us just take for granted every day, like the ability to have the motor control to cut apples, you know, or to lift a, a, a cup. I love her expression around the tsunami in the cup. So, of course, here, you know, really the last step of this journey is figuring out how do you get this therapy into patients' hands or onto patients' wrists in this case. And that really required an innovation all on its own. Um, it was important to us to do this in a way that uh, was both cost effective, to do our part in really trying to control some of the, cost, the skyrocketing uh, costs of healthcare, also in a way that was accessible for patients, both for rural as well as urban patients. Most Americans do not have access to major academic medical centers, for example, to access diverse populations. And really importantly, we were launching this product right into the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the solution that we came up with for how to do this was a patient-centered care model. So a physician prescribes a therapy. They might see the patient in person. Some of these physicians, especially during the pandemic, were seeing patients by telemedicine. You can see Tremor quite well by video. The device is then shipped directly to patients' home. We assist the patients with how to individually calibrate and use their therapy. Many patients prefer to uh, interact with a person, and so we have coaches. We have an amazing customer success team that will walk patients through this journey. Other people prefer to use videos, online tutorials. Most recently, one of the things we started uh, doing that uh, the patients and trainers are both loving is we're doing group sessions, bringing together you know, groups of five or 10 patients at a time. That also builds social connection, you know, along with having fun and uh, training on the device at the same time. This data is all provided back to the patient. If the patient chooses, it's also sent to their prescribing physician, who in turn can help the patient understand how to use the therapy more effectively. So I wanted to walk through this because it's just you know, one example of one product, but to me, this is really the kind of digital innovation that the healthcare system needs. We have not benefited in healthcare from the same kinds of efficiencies as areas like commerce or even highly regulated like areas like banking. And we critically need to both control the costs of care while also improving outcomes at the same time. And I deeply believe that with the appropriate regulation and legal structures, you know, this can be done. And this type, I think, of a service model is a great example of that future. So just to close this out here, uh, why now? Why, what, why bioelectronic medicines can, can take place today when they couldn't take place previously? And to me, this is really the intersection of three fields neuroscience and neuromodulation, along with data science and hardware. These three areas have really converged over the past couple decades uh, to open the door to new therapies like this. So let's touch base first on neuroscience. Here's another tractography image of the brain. How these are actually made is by watching mo water molecules flow along bundles of axons uh, through using, it's called diffusion tensor imaging in uh, MRI scanner. And you get highly precise models of the connectivity of the brain. On the right, what you see there is the output from uh, gene therapy. So this is actually looking at the timing of different neurons firing. And what I just find both humbling and awe-inspiring to, is, is to think about here is 
how it's really that timing that does everything from Carrie's information about, you know, the pain of stubbing your toe, to the touch of a loved one, to being able to control motor output, to feelings of love, of hatred, of empathy, uh, you know, of identity, of sense of self. These are all encoded in these, uh, in these temporal patterns, and it, this understanding of the time and space really enables us to, to tackle some very challenging disease categories. In parallel, there's been evolutions in computing. Uh, this has put what used to require an entire room, that sliver of a, a room you can see on the left is an IBM mainframe uh, in the 1960s. That went quickly onto desktops, laptops, onto your wrists, and that's really what's making this possible to take neurostimulation from more of a focus on stimulating the organ over on the left to stimulating the circuit. And I think that that is just a huge uh, shift in the way that we can really think about having less invasive ways uh, to treat the nervous system. If we go back even farther than the left, uh, some of the earlier, earliest records around using electricity as medicine um, come from both uh, Chinese records as well as the ancient Greeks. So here's a fun fact for you. Uh, the word narca is the Greek word for electric eel or ray. It is the, word of the, root, the root of the word narcotic. And that's because the Greeks actually used electric eels to treat you know, things like pain and depression, really forecasting the future of areas like spinal cord stimulation. When modern electrical medicine really began was in the 1950s with the cardiac pacemaker. In the 1960s, we used electricity to restore hearing for the deaf with cochlear stimulation. In the 1980s was the introduction of deep brain stimulation as discussed for essential tremor and Parkinson's. In the 2000s, we started to understand more the, about the circuitry and went to vagus nerve stimulation for diseases like epilepsy. And now we're moving this even farther out to the peripheral stimulation with technologies like TAPS. So that's where I'm going to wrap up uh, for today. But many thanks for your time and really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Oh, I'll call you up. They're going to bring up chairs. Um, thank you, Kate. That was incredible. I'm inspired. Aren't you all inspired seeing the <laughs> incredible advances? Um, we are going to have some time for a conversation. I'm going to invite all of the uh, speakers back up on the stage. I hope you have been thinking about your questions. And I want to broaden this out, right? I mean, one is just the incredibly mind-blowing advances and the people who can be impacted by the technology. The second is thinking about where is this all going and how does it affect everyone and how should we be thinking about it and engaging in that conversation. So that's where I'm hoping to take the conversation now. Um, and I'll open it up to see if there are questions already. There will be a mic that will be brought around to you. So raise your hand if you have a question. If not, I will get us started while you think of your questions. And so I'll get us started because I don't see a hand shooting up in the air. Um, and I'll come to you in a moment. But I'm going to ask one of the things, you can bring the mic up here uh, to the front. Um, one of the things that I heard each of you say in sort of a common and really interesting theme is easy. Now, none of this is easy, right? But one thing that is incredibly innovative about what Tom's company has done is instead of drilling a hole in the skull, right, they found a different way to get into the brain, enabling so many more physicians to do so, using a cath lab that is transformational. For Andreas, moving from implanted neurotechnology to a wearable device and thinking about those sensors and how those might be integrated much more broadly into the other AR devices that are coming out into the market. And the idea of wearing it on your wrist, right, and, and having something that is a precise and targeted therapeutic, um, none of this is actually easy when you guys say words like easy, but can you just speak for a moment to that about what this leap is, right, that is enabling this actually accessible technology, making it possible uh, to move in this direction? Like, what is it that has led to it, what, from an outsider, looks like a seismic shift in the ability to do this much more easily? So, Tom, I mean, like, what is it that makes makes it possible to think about, you know, what are the advances? Kate pointed to neuroscience, neuromodulation, data science. Like, what is it that enabled the ability to detect brain signals going up through, you know, the human blood vessels instead? Yeah, I think our, uh, for us, the history of medicine and interventional cardiology was really important. So mm -hmm. minimally invasive techniques to put in pacemakers, 
um, ventricular uh, pacing devices, um, all sorts of technology that happened in the heart. There's a joke in medicine that the brain's 30 years behind the heart in terms of innovation. So it was, it was that combination of things coming into neurology, I think. And then brain-computer interface was starting to emerge, and it typically required open brain surgery and has this problem of anything that's stuck into the brain. The blood-brain barrier is a thing because the, the way that the brain responds to foreign bodies is, a, is an issue, um, and so staying in the blood vessels solved one of those problems. But that, that's from my perspective. I just want to make a comment. Those, the, the two, everything you've seen today is very new, and there's incredible innovation happening. And congratulations to the both of you. I was really excited Thanks. to see. Congratulations to all three of you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> really, like what incredible. you are doing is transforming oh. humanity. And I mean, it's literally. I teared up seeing the videos of the patients and the population that you're impacting. It's. It is extraordinary, but Andreas, you know, what is it like? You mentioned the noise. It's been difficult to get signals, you know, out of the brain using EEG. What are what are advances that are enabling the innovations that that you're seeing? Well, what's interesting is I'm not a neuroscientist, <laughs> right? I'm a I'm a designer entrepreneur, but I know how to build teams, and so we have really great neuroscientists on the team. Um, but I think there has been a shift. Um, uh, from neuroscience to neuroengineering. Uh, and I think the ability to say science is, is fabulous, uh, but it's in the engineering part of if you apply, if you put engineers to the problem, they're gonna not necessarily look at it as a biology issue. They're gonna look at it as like a circuit issue, mm -hmm. right? And I think uh, sort of taking an orthogonal attack at the problem from a fresh perspective has been, uh, I think, a catalyst for a lot of innovation happening. Um, and so, and, you know, and having much more diverse teams. You know, I think this public-private partnership between government and university and uh, more loosely constrained IP transfer uh, uh, constraints uh, regarding how IP generated from a university or lab can then transfer into uh, a commercial partner. Um, so there's a lot of enabling conditions, I mean, just that are non-technical, non-science. Um, uh, I would say on the... On the, on the tech side, I'd say, you know, Moore's Law has done what it's doing and it's continuing on regarding sort of miniaturization of high powered capacity. Yep. So like what, yeah, so there's just a whole bunch of things that are all have happened over the past two decades that we're just sort of at this renaissance to say, what do we want to do today? Because there's so much amazing stuff that we can tap into. Well, uh, well and so Kate, looking, I mean, just mm -hmm. hold up your wrist for a minute. I mean, it just looks like a watch, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, is it advances in AI? Is it advances in, you know, engineering to be able to get it into this form factor, tracking and being able to map all of the electrical activity in the brain? Like, wh how are we here already? We're on your wrist. You can be deeply stimulating inside the brain. So I'm going to take this all the way to the complete opposite end. <laughs> okay. <which> is, <laughs> it's really by actually first and foremost focusing on the need and on the use case. And that's exactly where the technology to your question is gonna fold in. A lot of this technology exists, right? I'd say we are integrating, we are standing on the shoulders of giants, truly. You know, as, as, as Tom mentioned, I mean, cardiac stimulation, literally how the field of neurostimulation evolved was surgeons then taking a cardiac stimulator and saying, well, what if we implant this sort of alongside the spinal column and we get spinal you know, stimulation, we start implanting in the brain and we get deep, deep brain stimulation. You're always building on the technologies that existed before. So absolutely, I'd say it's all of those things. It's miniaturization, uh, probably a, a whole other conversation, but machine learning, AI, uh, these are very highly related to neuroscience. There's reasons neural networks are called neural networks. If you're a scientist, you say that that's how it was discovered. If you're an engineer, you'd say that's how it was invented. Um, but I just say, you know, I'm a really big believer uh, in first and foremost fo focusing on unmet needs. Mm -hmm. So for the team at Cala, our need statement from day one has been a way to restore the ability to eat, drink, and write for patients with severe essential tremor. And it's because of that that we didn't go technology first. We didn't look at the landscape of technology and say, based on picking this piece from here and this piece from here and this piece from here, what is, po what is possible? We did it 100% uh, sort of on its head, which is instead saying, there is a major unmet need for this patient population. What is their complex stakeholder analysis? What do the payers need? What do the physicians need? What do the, the patients need? And then going out and finding and folding in the technologies that are needed to, to solve that. And it's one of the areas I'm super passionate about is really starting with needs-driven innovation uh, as opposed to building from the technology. Great. Let's take a question here in the front row. No. It's not on. It's not on? 
Hello? There we go. Oh, yeah, yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, this is for Tom. Uh, can the, interfa the communica communications interface go both ways? This is kind of a hacking question to kind of trigger unintended intentions, if that's even a concept. Um, also for uh, Andreas, how do you get the cost of what you're delivering down where it can actually be delivered to people who need it? Great question. Uh, inserting volition is not a technique that I'm familiar with. Uh, stimulation into the brain will create a sensation, but I guess volition isn't internally driven. I mean, can I say that, is there a mechanism to insert volition into the brain? That's a very interesting question. I don't believe so, but I wouldn't say never. Um, it's certainly a long way away from where the technology is right now, because volition is really a broad system thing. It's like motivation's deep and there's, you know. Um, now, stimulation does happen. So the, the first application of stimulation to the brain would be for haptic feedback. So you stimulate the sensory cortex. You know, on the Apple products where you hit the bar, it's not actually depressing. It just buzzes and makes you think it's clicked. So that's an example of haptic feedback giving. It's really important because you need to know when you clicked the bar. That's going to become important for BCIs, for patients to have the feeling of knowing that they've just engaged in a system. I think that'll be the first um, sensory input in. But no, I'm not aware of how you generate uh, will or intention. Um, regarding cost, it's really about business model innovation uh, for us. Um, I mean, first and foremost, our core is we're building a medical device business that's going to get cleared through the FDA and covered by Medicare uh, and Medicaid and private insurance. Um, uh, we're already CMS accredited, so we're ready to go from a DME perspective, durable medical equipment billing perspective. Um, we're just waiting to clear FDA as a class two de novo device so that can be cleared. Today, there's existing reimbursement codes for speech generating devices and uh, environmental controls. So that demonstration of controlling Alexa or speaking, the coding already exists. There's hundreds of millions of dollars that, that have already been paid out and supported uh, a minority of groups um, for that. Um, <clears throat> but for us to really truly democratize what we're talking about, um, it's in the business model innovation. So what we're doing is applying a lot of our R&D and innovation and creating validated IP so we don't just blanket IP and you know bomb the USPTO with patents, but we're really focused on patents that work um, and then software that works because we want to ideally have partners such as the Apples, the Metas, whatever, that we're solving the really har the hardest problems from a usability perspective and a biology interface perspective. But we understand that we call it universal design. So by if you think about curb cuts at intersections that were originally designed for people with wheelchairs, uh, or had limited gait, right? Everyone sort of feels inconvenienced if you have to step over a curb now, right? Or if the doors at a store don't open automatically, you th what a hassle, right? Like that's universal design. So we envision that designing for, for disabilities first is core, solve those hard problems, but then license our IP uh, and software uh, to make accessibility more broadly available across mainstream platforms. And I think that's how we can subsidize uh, some of the costs. It's worth noticing that a lot of the technology that we have in our everyday lives started as assistive technology, right? And that m much of it starts focused on a patient population or um, you know, ways to enable people and then becomes widespread throughout society. So if you look at the history of a lot of different technologies, you see that. And when you see what you're designing at the same time as you know, Meta and Apple are announcing mm -hmm. you know, major AR and VR headsets with sensors that are integrated, it's easy to see how this technology bec could become much more mainstream. I'm just gonna invite uh, hands. Yep, we have over here in the front row and then we'll go over there. Yeah, wait, wait for the mic to come over to you. Thank you so much. This is also Kate and Andreas. Similar question. I mean, your device is specific to, to the treatment, I guess, that you're looking at. But how about integration? I mean, you can use it also like the Apple Watch or any of the wearables to have other things available there. Uh, so this becomes more of a unified device and people will be wearing, I'm wearing a lot of them right now, but <laughs> hopefully they'll get all integrated into one. Why do you have also a screen on yours? Well, you, uh, that would be, Andrea, same thing. I mean, you have something there you're, you're sensing, but you could sense other stuff uh, and, and use that to, to augment or to assist uh, the, the subject. Great question. So uh, really bringing, bringing access to a therapy like this requires navigating sort of several different, among other things, policy landscapes. So for us, sort of two of the key areas have been both the regulatory landscape as well as the reimbursement landscape. So uh, 
so currently, this is a, I'd say, it's sort of a standalone, as in it's an enclosed system. Um, algorithms are run on board the device itself. Um, we do have uh, cloud connectivity through the base station as well. That's what supports, for example, the portals that I was alluding to that allows the information about usage and efficacy to be viewed by a patient and by a physician. However, the regulatory environment for that is, I would say, very appropriately conservative and complex. So to do full integration into consumer wearables would require a level of control over the technology, just right to the level of things like software upgrades onto those technologies. Um, did I just say that I think we're not ready for yet? We will get there. I have been amazed at the efforts that the, uh, that the FDA is un undergoing in really looking at that more sort of software and hardware integration into these technologies, but we need to walk before we run so that we really maintain cybersecurity, patient privacy, and sort of control over the systems. Going to the far other side on, on reimbursement, uh, as Andreas just brought up as well. So this therapy has had a national coverage policy with the Veterans Administration for three years um, already. Um, it is also sort of available with much of uh, private insurance. We're currently working uh, with Medicare as well on getting access to the technology. And that requires a lot of steps through four pillars you need. You need coding. We had to get our own new codes for this. You need pricing. We had to get our own new prices for this. You need benefit category and you need coverage. So basically fitting into all of those ways the healthcare system is built sometimes requires what I would use sort of, again, that, you know, walking before you run. So we are so eager to get there. I believe that the field will get there eventually, but it's being developed within the co appropriate controls of the existing systems. One thing we want, we're going to come to on that, um, thinking about its integration into every, every device is thinking about other indications and in yes. usage, right? Because yes. presumably there's a lot mm -hmm. that's happening in the brain from stress to depression to all kinds of other conditions that writing back into the brain could enable a lot of therapy for. Andreas? And if I understand your question, why a BCI with a visor, with a display? No, why not integrate more sensors, but I understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we, um, uh, we sort of envision what we're doing as a hub and the notion of having an API that can take data from other sensors, whether that's textile computing or implants or joysticks or any other kind of external inputs. Uh, we're agnostic to that as a system. Um, we have our core systems that we have built in for the specific use case that we have, but we know that through translational research, there could be other use cases for our technology that we're not even aware of. Um, so we wanted to have that open opportunity to do what's called sensor fusion, right? Like the ability to have sensor coming from multiple sources on a timed, on a timer, essentially, to be able to synchronize that in system to be able to do multimodal input. Um, and then I think the easy part, going back to easy, right? It's to make things easy, it's hard to make things easy, <laughs> right? That's the thing is like you're t everyone up here, you know, we're doing a lot of the hard work so that it looks easy and for the user, the unboxing experience is easy. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we do at our company, we use, I created this term called TTV, time to value. And so if you think about marketing, you're making a promise and then you get a shipment at your door and you unbox it and you're like, how quickly can I realize that, that promise? Does it do what it said it would do? And so do that in clock cycle, time to value. So if you think about that in the time spectrum to realize a value proposition, consumer technology, the bar is very, very high, right? Amazon Prime sort of <laughs> skewed everything with next day delivery and Apple did a great job of expecting a delightfully simple experience. And so that's a very high bar. Um, so we're willing to stretch into that. And I think we're trying, in, the only way to break out of medical device and out of the lab into mainstream is to make things simple for users, right? Don't make them, don't make me think too hard about setting this up because you're trying to in engender um, ritualistic behavior and adoption of a technology that's useful. Um, and we already know like with drug compliance that, you know, people don't take their pills on schedule, but if you can create a delightful experience around communication access or other things which don't require the person to think too hard about it, um, then it becomes second nature and it is the first thing that they would want to reach for in the morning. Delightful experience for your brain. Keep that in mind. I can see a lot of your minds are clicking over the possibilities. Um, it helps you, I think, think about the fact that this could become something that's integrated into our everyday lives, which opens up tremendous hope and promise, also risks. Also risks uh, what our mental privacy looks like, our self-determination. And so that's part of the conversation that these guys have all been engaged in throughout. Um, we have a question that, I, yep, with the visor right there, yep, and then we'll come forward after that. So.
Um, hi. Thank you all so much. I've got to start with that. I mean, this has been as just revolutionary, exciting, and fascinating as it gets, and thank you. Um, but I've got to move to um, an area very important to me, vision. And I wanted to see if there's anything nanotech or anything on the horizon that can transfer to the optic nerve and the vision issues and everything going on with um, optic neuropathies. Is that something yeah. that you feel? Yeah. So Max Hodak, who was one of the co-founders of Neuralink, who uh, left Neuralink, uh, he started a new company called Science, science.xyz. And they are building something incredible. It's, I, I'm not going to do a good job of describing it, but they're using um, genetic engineering with optogenetics to make cells light sensitive um, in the brain, connecting that to a chip using calcium something. And it basically is, a, is an eye prosthesis. So I, I think he's, he's within a group of, of technologies that's looking towards visual prosthesis. And there's obviously the example of um, Second Sight, quite famously. There was a, I think it was a Wall Street Journal piece around the ethics of leaving devices inside the body where the company couldn't make it successful. So that was kind of a first generation attempt at an eye prosthesis. And there's a second generation coming with science leading that charge to look out for. Tom raises one of the ethical questions that, have been, that has been vexing, which is to think about, particularly with implanted devices, not even implanted devices, assisted devices that are in progress. They may, you know, companies may go out of business. They may stop producing it that enable people, and then the devices are no longer serviced or they're taken away, and what that does to kind of continuity of a person's self-identity and mm -hmm. how we think about those issues. They're very difficult issues. There was a question right up here. Uh, yep. Um, so we'll wait for a microphone to come up here. Um, we'll probably have time for one more question after that, but we'll see. We've got about four minutes left, and so we'll see if we have time for this last question. Okay, real quick. This is for Kate. Uh, your technology is currently limited to essential tremor. And what do you see on the horizon as other potential uh, indications that your technology could be useful for? Yeah, so this, um, so this particular device, uh, the unique timing of the stimulation is relative to the physiology, to the timing of the tremor. Um, so I'd say this technology is, is specific to that area. We are also uh, running clinical studies in a number of other fields, uh, including other indications in neurology, psychiatry, cardiology. Um, I'd say every field is characterized by different nerve targets and different timing uh, signals. So really the key is where are the diseases where we understand which deep organ has a signal oscillation challenge, and then how can we test whether peripheral input to detect that signal and then modulate that signal will have therapeutic benefit. Great. We're going to get the microphone back there and to the back right corner. Thank you. Hi. I wondered where is the technology, Kate? You touched on this going in terms of mental health. Yeah, um, so uh, mental health are, are amazing applications of this. Uh, we've also been running some studies that are in that area as well. I'd say one of the real uh, challenges actually is this intersection of regulation and reimbursement. Um, and particularly sort of in some of the areas where there has been you know, historically lack of favorable reimbursement, I'd say this particularly comes up into some areas, including areas of pain, as well as uh, some psychiatric conditions. Um, and so I think that this is really where it does need the, the public involvement uh, in really helping you know, support and helping sort of open the doorway with these newer uh, technologies to get them the new, among other things, the new co coding payment and pricing that are needed to bring these to, you know, that are needed to bring these to market. I'm a big believer there's huge applications uh, in, in uh, mental health and psychiatric applications. And happy to discuss afterwards, there's too. In the far back. And, okay. and deep we, brain we, stimulation is on the cusp of approval in depression. Yeah. So there's been a couple of negative studies. Abbott is le leading company close to getting it, but there's been some studies that have not quite been there. But the, the stories of the patients with severe depression there are some anecdotal stories that you can just Google if you're looking at deep brain stimulation in depression, the stories of the patients having the system switched on and the black clouds lifting. And it's not, I feel happy, it's the dread has gone away. So that, that's, I think we'll see that emerge over the next five to 10 years. All right, regrettably, we are at the end of our time. 
Um, and so uh, I know that there are additional questions that there are to be asked, but I, I hope that this has taken you on a journey of some of the extraordinary breakthroughs. It's very easy for people to go quickly dystopian with AI and the advances in neurotechnology um, without realizing the context of how many lives are being transformed and potentially could be transformed to enable them to have self-determination, to regain the ability to navigate the world. So these are the pioneers of those changes. There are others out there as well, but these are truly at the cutting edge. Every time I hear a presentation from them, there is some new discovery, some new opportunity, some new person's life that they have touched. So please join me in giving them a big round of applause. And thank you all for being here.